Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Melanie Phillips, Ian Dunt are here. Let's move straight to a related story um, about the committee one we saw in the Commons just a short time ago in the Daily Express. And this follows yesterday's vote, which the government also won, and what the opposition is now trying to do to disrupt it. Well, they are going to, as I said before, it's going to be hand-to-hand -hand fighting from now on in. 59 pages of amendments to the Brexit bill. Why only 59? <laughs> I would have expected many more. I mean, seriously, um, it's going to be, you know, every single thing is going to be fought uh, to the bitter end. The uh, people who voted uh, remain uh, on both sides, on all sides of the House, are going to leave absolutely uh, no amendment unturned, as it were, to try and overturn it by hook or by crook, and mainly by crook. Um, they wish to frustrate the will of the British people. So you uh, don't buy into the idea that it was a power grab, this E. <laughs> He's got his head in his hands already. Um, the, you don't buy into the opposition view that this is a power grab uh, by the government who could override rules if we simply transferred EU law into British law. Yeah, there is a concern here, and I share it, um, the so-called Henry VIII clauses, because the thing is being done by kind of executive power, by the government power, rather than uh, MPs voting on every single uh, proposition. But quite clearly, uh, a change of this magnitude to disentangle uh, the United Kingdom from the European Union with uh, hundreds and hundreds uh, of clauses and subclauses and so on, it cannot be done other than by this method. Um, and consequently, while we all, I think, should be concerned uh, that precedence, you know, is being set and so on, um, uh, and it is, you know, the potential for misuse uh, shouldn't be uh, dismissed. But nevertheless, unless one wishes to frustrate the will of the British people, mm. <laughs> then one has to accept this is how it has to be done. Uh, right, OK, so look, I mean, the thing is, statutory instruments are obviously a requirement of how you do this. The way the statutory instruments work is they basically allow you to take apart what are supposed to be technicalities in law, stuff that you don't really need to debate on the floor of the Commons, and you can do that by ministerial action, OK? So it's perfectly responsible, perfectly reasonable that you'd use it in some aspects of Brexit. However, if you are about to start changing nearly half a century of law, it is incumbent on the government, so some basic sense of responsibility about the protections that it puts up, Instead, what they have done is pass one of the most monstrous, irresponsible bills that I've ever seen in my entire life. Clause 9 of the bill mm -hmm. allows them to use these powers on the bill itself. So any of the safeguards that are in that bill can then be undone by the powers that they have granted themselves within that bill. This is basically like turning ministers into little mini-parliaments who can do whatever they want. And the absolute hypocrisy of seeing months and months and months of Brexiters bang on about parliamentary sovereignty. And now suddenly here they come and just grab all of these powers, rip it away from Parliament and hand it to the government. It is absolutely astonishing. Hang on, hang on, hang on. It is Parliament that has voted for this. And it's not a matter of hypocrisy at all. I understand the concern. I share the concern. I think it's a perfectly valid concern. But it is not hypocrisy to say, because Brexiteers like myself and the majority of the British who voted uh, for Britain to leave the European Union no longer wish to be governed by the European Union, it is not hypocrisy to say that in order to get this legislation through, we have to have this executive power. That is not hypocrisy. Parliament has voted for this. No one is questioning the executive power. The question is, when we have these amendments, these are about the safeguards towards that power. They are absolutely crucial. It's not about saying you can't have statutory instruments. It's about saying, fine, there should be advanced sight. There should be committees evaluating whether they're being used in a way that is actually applicable. There should be a greater use of super affirmative procedures, which acts an extra layer of scrutiny to the whole which thing. Which has lost us, I think. Sorry about all that, but nevertheless, no, no. But the, the, look, it sounds boring, but the really boring stuff in politics is where you really pay attention, because mm. that's how they do you. You know, they make it boring, they make it sound very, very tedious, no one pays attention, and that's where they get away with the really pernicious stuff, and that is exactly what is happening here. Now, these but amendments, you... labelled by Tory and Labour, yeah. are there to add those safeguards that you were mentioning, so I don't see why they would be attacked as trying to thwart the will 
of the people, or one of the people which Theresa May is right now in the Commons trying to get out of her way so that she can have a majority on the floor that she otherwise didn't earn by going to the country. They are not to thwart the will of the people, quite the opposite. They are there to put a safeguard against the powers that the government But you're suggesting handed. the government wants to be pernicious, as though there is some conspiracy to take further control than All necessary, that this is just a, you know, a side element of it, that they, that they seize control All in All governments simply want more power. I mean, that's just in the nature of government. If a government can get away, especially a minority government that, you know, has trouble in the Commons, of course is going to try and lay the ground so that it can do as much as it possibly can with as little interference as humanly possible and that's what they're doing it's perfectly natural for a government to behave this way mm -hmm. the problem is that the press and parliament are not holding them to account as they should do and because they are absolutely hectored and petrified by this nonsense about the will of the people mm. okay um, i'm going to go to uh, public sector pay it's all over the papers uh, the eye for example um, on the reaction to this by the unions illegal strike threat on public pay their argument, of course, that with uh, inflation up to 2.9%, this is once again a pay cut. Um, just moving through, The Guardian may face his pay backlash after lifting 1% cap. And uh, the final reaction also from The Telegraph, uh, which is the suggestion that Bobby's on the beat will uh, be cut to fund the 2% pay rise because the money is found from his existing budgets. Yes, I mean, it's all sort of slate of hand and it's all just high politics. I mean, Mrs May, uh, the Conservatives uh, had a fright uh, because of Jeremy Corbyn and they suddenly thought, my goodness, the people out there don't like austerity. Oh dear, who would have thought it? We must immediately show that we are sensitive to these, these concerns. And so we have the lifting of the public sector pay cap. Well, kind of. If it's from existing budgets, well, exactly. this has always been the concern. It's a slate of hand. So, you know, is it going to fool anybody? No. Is it going to uh, mean that we don't have, uh, you know, wildcat strikes and all the rest of it? Uh, no. Um, everyone's going to be even more furious than ever before. It doesn't seem to me to be the most brilliant kind of politics. It seems to me to sort of fall into the category of what I would call, you know, knee-jerk absurdity. Yeah, exactly. It's, you know what's incredible about the government is just how ineffectively it does all the things that it wants to do. Like, I mean, you could see this one coming a mile off. I mean, mm. Jeremy Hunt was, was dropping hints towards nurses who presumably will figure later on in this. Back in March, the police officers have been getting it, the uh, prison officers have been getting it. And yet, out it comes. Everyone was saying right from the start, every newspaper, they're going to take it from the existing budgets, aren't yeah. they? And if they do yeah. that, that just means a greater degradation in the way that prisons operate. That means you've got to get rid of more worries on the beat. That means in the case of nursing, that you would have to have longer waiting times, more money spent on, on uh, sorry, the inability to, to buy sort of medical equipment. All of that is the case that was known in the press, it was known in the mm. trade unions. The government go and just walk uh, into the ditch anyway. And the other thing is, they don't seem to have understood what is, you know, by by all accounts, um, the single most important fact in politics at the moment, that people want to be able to trust politicians. People don't trust politicians. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you say austerity is necessary because, you know, the country is living above its means, we have this tremendous debt, we all have to, you know, do our thing, then you stick to it. If you don't stick to it, you but they have stuck respect to it. completely. But they have stuck but to they it. But they are now pur purporting not to. So how can that possibly benefit them? If they say one thing to the people one day and then the next day they say, oh, well, that's the end of posterity then, mm. everyone's going to say, what? What was all that about then? I mean, by any standard, you, it's incoherent. Yeah, but if you don't take it from existing budgets, and this was always the concern of the teachers' pay body, they said they never rec recommended above 1% because they thought it would come out of schools' funding, which exactly. is already in short supply. If you don't take it out of existing budgets, what do you do? Do you follow Labour's policy of taxing the richest 5%, for example, even though some economists say that this economy is almost maxed out on what you can tax its people. Yeah, or, or you borrow more. I mean, basically, but ultimately, it comes under the same thing. You've got to end austerity. Now, this, then, isn't, this isn't ending austerity. But then what was this the fight to reduce the deficit all about if you're borrowing more again? Well, that had a certain degree of, of moderate success, but it was always a fundamentally illiterate economic project. It was a profoundly you know, foolish way to behave when you were suffering exactly that period in the economic cycle. The best thing to have done would actually to have been to increase spending and increase borrowing in order to stimulate the economy. But whichever way we feel about what happened seven years ago, right now what the government is trying to do is do the PR of ending austerity without actually ending austerity. And what you said is entirely correct. Integrity now is that the key quality that the public look for in politicians. We're in a very specific historical moment where that seems to overrule everything else that used to be valued in politicians. 
They used to value strength. Yeah. They used to value sort yeah. of having no competition within parties. Now it is integrity. And for the government, if you look at the news stories that we're addressing right now, of Theresa May basically you know, losing an election and then stitching it up in the Commons, of Theresa May presenting with one way on austerity and then doing something else, the public may not follow the details on all of these things, mm. but they do get the message, which is a government that says one thing and is secretly doing another. OK, but anyway, <laughs> uh, oil and clothes push up costs related to the pay, obviously, inflation up again. Yeah, inflation cracking. I mean, we had a couple of months where it was sort of starting to slow. People thought maybe, you know, this is an end to it. It looks like it actually isn't an end to it, especially oil, especially clothing, especially shoes. Not quite so much on food. Ultimately, again, this is the classic Brexit story. If you're watching this, you are poorer because of Brexit. It is as simple as that. This process is going on and on Apocalypse and on. now, world ends. And it will, what about, you know, for lower-income families, it, 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 that is a thing. You can afford to go out to eat less. You can low afford pound, to buy less food. Low pound, more profitable exports. Exactly. Course. Well, exactly. Except, more jobs. Except the exports did not more increase jobs. To, the, to the degree that we would be expecting given what had taken place there. And partly that's to do because the companies that are selling that stuff overseas need to import things from overseas in order to make that product. So is there a median value of the pound that benefits both us at home and our concern about the cost of living increases and exporting to have a thriving economy? At any given moment, presumably, that value exists, but no, nobody ever knows what it is, or else they would be able to run a harmonious and utopian society. <laughs> 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 which doesn't seem any too close to where we are right now. Uh, no, indeed. So let's go to Bill Gates, uh, world's richest man, The Telegraph tells us, saying that Brexit, uh, post-Brexit UK can excel. Is this Melanie's department? Well, yeah. good gracious. <laughs> this cannot possibly be, because we've just been told, we are told the whole time by Mr no, Dunn, the world's about to end <laughs> completely. <laughs> so clearly Bill Gates knows very much less. Um, no, I think it's, it's perfectly sensible. I mean, what he is saying, he's saying that Britain has tremendous uh, uh, skills and talent base in terms of science, that that is itself um, an extremely valuable uh, commodity, as it were, um, and that provided care is taken, brackets, we don't quite know what he means by provided care is taken, but there's no reason why after Brexit... I think Brexit... keep investing in science and yes. technology. Yes. Uh, his organisation has invested a billion dollars in places like Cambridge, Oxford, Liverpool, Edinburgh and London yes. because they're the best at doing lots of this important work. Yes, because, says. hello, people like Bill Gates, it would appear, have some actual confidence in Great Britain as a producer of excellent things. And, I mean... I do have sympathy with people who, like, like Ian um, uh, because, you know, they lost the argument uh, big time and they are, you know, they are genuinely very concerned about all kinds of details to do with the Brexit negotiation and so on. And I think some of those concerns are perfectly valid. But what I do object to is a complete lack of balance. The, the, the impression that is given that Great Britain has so little to offer that it's in the weakest possible position. Oh, it's a nonsense. supplicant. You, that's the impression no, you no, give that's, all that's, that's the time. Not fair. Actually, it has no what advantages. Patri what patriots it has do. no. It has no leverage. What? We have tremendous leverage because people want what we have. What Why don't we start do talking? Even the head of the German car manufacturers has told us this evening that they are preparing for a hard Brexit. Well, meanwhile, a senior German car executive has told Sky News that Britain will pay the highest price if it leaves, leaves the EU without a trade deal. The head of the German Automotive Association has also said that it set up a task force to make contingency plans in the event of a hard Brexit. That would change everything. Uh, if uh, we would uh, fall down the cliff edge would be very critical for all sides, uh, would also damage uh, part of our uh, concepts uh, in Britain and elsewhere. But it's clear the higher price would be paid by the British people. And it was the German car industry, like the Italian Prosecco industry, were the industries that were supposed to secure us a, a great deal on leaving the European Union. Because people that really care about Britain prepare carefully for each eventuality to secure the quality of life of people within the country. That is what patriotism is, it's not an emotional instinct, it is a fundamentally rational instinct towards ensuring that the country does well. And to say that, you know, this is problematic or that this is a terrible error of judgment is not to lack faith in Britain. Quite the opposite is to have enough faith in Britain that one cares intensely about the things that it does. And it's always very unfortunate when people but you present don't have it enough faith, faith. But, but you don't have enough faith in Britain to want it to govern itself. Well, of course. Of course that it's going to is the itself. ultimate absence of patriotism. It no less doesn't govern itself than I wouldn't govern myself if I said that we should both walk in the same direction. Ah, oh, so democracy resources. is an illusion. <laughs> Sovereignty is an illusion. Here we have classic 
remain a pathology. <laughs> Democracy is an illusion. <laughs> None of us is sovereign. None of us is free. None of us is free to govern ourselves. So who cares about whether or not we have a sovereign parliament? Keeping it brief. Anyway, it didn't happen. We've now, we're not doing gambling. A warning about how dangerous tattoos are. All you see what you've done? Strictly come dancing. We could have talked about tattoos. But we will later uh, pay all over the papers. The Metro keeps it simple. Pay Thor may lift 1% public sector cap, while other papers like the R I warn of the reaction from unions should the government not do more to address this issue. I mean, the interesting thing politically is looking at the union reaction mm -hmm. is not any kind of gratefulness at all, but actually that sort of recognition of, oh, OK, we've got momentum here, we've, we've got you here, and we're going to push much, much harder. On the ropes kind of feeling. Yeah, exactly. So strategically, in terms of dealing with the unions, it doesn't seem to have done any good at all, and in fact, arguably, has made things worse. Mm. Then you look at the rest of the coverage. I think it was The Times somewhere that was mm -hmm. focusing on, you know, mm -hmm. actually the cuts you'd have to services if you're going to provide this. So even the press reaction has actually not been that positive. Yeah, the they, Telegraph, Bobby's on, Bobby's the, Telegraph, on the beat will be cut to fund the 2% pay rise. Yeah, yeah do because as we were saying earlier, you know, this is coming out of the existing budget, the budget is not being expanded, so if you give more money over here, you've got to take it away from over here. Classic sleight of hand. So if, you, if you're sat in Downing Street right now and think, well, look, we're, we're trying to stave off this sort of new winter of discontent. We're trying to make it look as if we're kinder, we're not mm. so bad. We're trying to stop Jeremy Corbyn from being able to advance onto our lawns in this way. You would look at this and say, this is not ideal. This is not the response that we wanted. Mm. It, I agree entirely. It just seems so incoherent and ill thought through. Um, it, it seems to me to be a, you know, a sort of knee-jerk response to the sort of panic that uh, took over. Uh, after the near miss with Jeremy Corbyn and the election, mm. Mm. Uh, in which the Conservatives suddenly said, oh my goodness, the public actually don't like austerity. Uh, we must head off Jeremy Corbyn by throwing some money at them. Mm -hmm. Well, as, uh, as Ian has said, I mean, it's, it's a slate of hand because there's no fresh money. It's divisive because it's setting one group against the other, so it's likely to enrage trade unions more than others. But even more than that, I mean, austerity, you know, people don't like austerity for obvious reasons, mm -hmm. but what they don't like even more is lack of integrity and lack of consistency and if you're going to say to people as the government did say we're in a parlous position we're spending too much we're borrowing too much we've got to pull in pull in uh, pull spending back and it's going to be painful for everybody everybody might sort of you know uh, uh, leap up and down and say this is terrible but basically that's the strategy that's the policy so a and a kind of political moment, honesty is what you're saying yes, and and this this moment, like you're saying well in fact that's it you know now austerity is over chaps I mean everyone's saying well what was all that for then? I mean, are we now out of the woods? Is the country no longer in a state of... Uh, is the country's, are the country's finances now absolutely fine? It's clearly absurd from every single point of view. And there seems to be no strategic thinking going on anywhere. Uh, at, no, at no level in government. No one's got any sense. No one's got any common sense. Is that because Theresa May lost her key advisers, do you think? Or, oh or, God, or simply I mean, they're, that... They're even worse. Or, the, or that they are distracted by, by everything that Brexit brings with it? Well, I'm, I'm, I, I don't know. I would imagine that Mrs May is thinking about nothing but Brexit. Um, but that's really no excuse. I mean, she is the Prime Minister of a country which has to keep running. Um, and uh, it's no excuse for this sort of incoherence. So what's the alternative then um, to, you know, using the money from existing budgets, only picking a couple of public sector workers or, or, or sectors which will get the increase? What, what, what could they have done instead? Well, I mean, you have to end austerity, which is basically to say that we're going to borrow more money or we're going to tax people more. I mean, it really is as simple as that. But, of course, to do that would trigger a rebellion on the Tory benches, so it can't be done. So instead, you get the sort of presentational sort of front, but no real content to go behind it. And again, it just points to a sort of government that doesn't really have any values, doesn't really have any principles, no convictions. It's just staggering from one story to another, terrified of this, you know, of Jeremy Corbyn, who is himself this really quite shambolic politician. Extraordinary to see him now basically calling the shots across the political spectrum. Mm. Look at the heart of this is also the fact that there really is no authority in Downing Street. There's a prime minister, but there's a prime minister really in name only. She has no authority to go along with the job title. She can't enforce her will. So at various times, you get various different ministers who are able to push their agenda forward. And it just, mm. what you get is basically no character to government whatsoever, no real sense of drive or purpose to it. And 
you're presented with the kind of thing that we see right now, which is, you know, you're almost unable to attribute to any characteristics whatsoever. Yeah, I like this Quentin Lett's uh, review of Jeremy Corbyn at the TUC conference. Mr Corbyn's speech, half-hearted at best, opened with some stuff about a Colombian trade union activist, etc., etc. He's trying to uh, criticise it, when actually he was in his element today, and the, and the audience were absolutely loving what he was saying. Yeah, there's a, there's a Patrick Kidd uh, sketch in The Times where he's sort of, you know, talking about these old Labour leaders when they used to go to the TUC. You'd have Tony Blair there, if you remember, you would just want to crawl into the floor when Tony Blair was talking to them. He would sort of start saying, and it, just total silence and hatred coming from the TUC. Now, of course, Jeremy Corbyn comes and he is, you know, the king over the water, brought in, absolutely loved by the people there, and he gets this rather raucous reception. Yeah. Did you want to say something about I was just going to say it's a rather sort of um, uh, uh, dismal accolade that, you know, the Trade Union Congress uh, uh, fawns over Jeremy Corbyn. Um, it's not something that fills me with a great deal of uh, enthusiasm that they are so, uh, so keen on Jeremy Corbyn. Um, but anyway, it takes something to, uh, you know, to, to make Jeremy Corbyn look like a, a statesman in waiting. Well, the unions do represent workers, obviously, and the workers feel that they're on the march at the moment, don't they? That's, that's kind of the point, I suppose. But... There, I mean, there is some tension in the relationship actually over Brexit, which we'll come to later, but actually you started to see that the last few weeks the TUC being a bit more strident in their opposition towards leaving the single market. Unite has been a union that's been quite torn on that sort of thing, on the manufacturing wing, there's been concern about leaving the single market, but the sort of more pro-Corbyn wing has been much more positive about Brexit. Mm. And actually, the, the one source of tension in that relationship really does stem on Corbyn's sort of quite mercurial view of the subject. That's the only real bit of tension, but they're still, you know, considering him in extremely warm terms. Yes, and there's the, uh, the political sketch you talked about in The Times, uh, but you also wanted to talk about Sadiq Khan, um, mm. also on this uh, inside pages of The Times. Yes, I mean, uh, Sadiq Sadiq Khan, uh, apparently, uh, according to uh, the story in, uh, in The Times, um, uh, is, wants to make a speech at the Labour Party conference, mm -hmm. um, uh, but there are plans to exclude him from the podium. Now, it's not entirely clear quite why uh, Mr Khan is being uh, denied this opportunity, uh, but it would appear that another, a number of other people are also being denied the podium. Uh, various several front benches responsible for key portfolios such as defence, transport and housing. Mr Corbyn and his allies insist that the event should be devoted to policy debates for the rank and file <laughs> membership. It does sound rather as if the entire Labour Party conference is going to be devoted to tractor production in the Ukraine. We do have, it has to be said that the people that are speaking, especially you mentioned in this article, John McDonnell, uh, Emily Thornbury, Diane Abbott, of course, key sort of Corbyn loyalists. There is Keir Starmer there, who isn't quite, quite be considered a Corbyn loyalist, but has managed to sort of, you know, keep his nose clean on this sort of stuff. It hasn't really been attacking Corbyn in any meaningful way. He's been trying to work inside of the tent, really, on, on the stuff that he does. So you get this impression of it being structured around the power of the leader. This is, of course, the first conference since he's had a, an unexpectedly successful sort of general election campaign. Impossible to know what really went on there, but, but certainly very, very interesting to see the name well, of the Well, it looks school. like organisation and strategy, which everyone criticised Jeremy Corbyn for lacking at the beginning. Yes, so. but I mean, you see, <laughs> I mean, we've been sort of hammering on uh, against uh, Mrs May and the sort of chaos in the Conservative government. But what all this uh, reminds us is uh, the uh, appalling plight, as it were, uh, of the so-called moderates in the Labour Party who are just sitting there watching their party be destroyed and being taken over by this hard left faction um, and not doing anything about it. Mm. Um, and this, to me, is actually uh, as worrying, if not more worrying, uh, than the uh, uh, difficulties that Mrs May is, 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 is experiencing. And yet Mrs May has won two key votes in the Commons in the last two days. Yeah. Uh, down the bottom there, the Times saying that she's won this vote on the control of key, com key committees as if they were a majority government. They should therefore take control of the key committees, the, the key select committees. And uh, the other story, of course, was yesterday uh, and the Express suggesting that there will be at least 59 pages of amendments to this Brexit bill, which the yeah. government won. Good on the Times, by the way, of managing to get it in there. The, the, this yes. is sort of breaking when we're here. It's only just come out. They've still to get it in the paper. This is basically something that sounds very dry and tedious. It's the, the selection committees, which basically pick the MPs that go forward for the standing committees, which then look at a piece of legislation line by line. But this is part of the core mechanics of the way that you look at legislation. This is a very, very cheeky little move that the government has managed to secure here. When we say that they have no purpose, when we say they have no direction, one of the things that they do have purpose on direction about is trying to ex 
expand their power on passing legislation, primarily Brexit legislation, because it's really the only thing left that the government's really doing at the moment. But nevertheless, it could be for all legislation. This is an attempt really to just try and pretend the general election never happened, act like she won a majority that she actually didn't manage to do, and very telling that despite all the noise coming, especially from constitutionally minded conservatives, mm -hmm. No rebellions out there, just like yesterday, no real rebellions taking place on the Tory benches. It does seem like she's doing surprisingly well with these Commons votes. OK, we must move on. Um, Financial Times, front page, but small and hard to find. But Melanie is very <laughs> interested in uh, these crack machines, uh, so gambling. Tell us more. Yes, these are the uh, fixed odds the second betting one down, terminals. The second one Fixed odds betting odds betting terminals yes uh, which uh, for reasons too complicated to go into in such a short period of time um, are said to uh, very much um, accentuate uh, the tendency of people to get addicted uh, to gambling now addiction to gambling is a major and growing problem mm -hmm. uh, lots and lots of people are addicted to gambling and what's interesting is that um, in recent months um, the government wanted to curb these uh, fixed odds betting terminals in order to try to deal with this problem of, of, of gambling addiction. The Treasury uh, didn't want these things to be curbed because, guess what, lots of money coming into the Treasury. Um, somebody seems to have persuaded Mr Hammond to stop objecting and consequently these machines are going to be curbed and Britain's biggest bookmakers, says the Financial Times, are set to lose at least 150 million mm -hmm. in annual revenues. Now, I've always felt very strongly about the liberalisation of gambling um, uh, because I always thought it would hit poor people very, very badly. They were the people who were most strongly likely... against it. In yes, words, right. yes. To, 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 to liberal, it was the Labour government that liberalised gambling. The Labour government liberalised all kinds of stuff. It liberalised all night drinking. It liberalised um, uh, clubbing. It liberalised all the stuff that does harm to people. It was this capitalist new Labour then? Was yes, it? it was. It was all to do with we're revitalising the inner city, making lots of money for everybody. And the gambling thing I thought was pernicious because it's poor people who are most lured mm -hmm. by this business of you know it could be my my, my lucky day mm. and this was I this, attitude, like that at this attitude of mine was criticized on the basis yeah. that this was patronizing to poor people and so now we see uh, people you know who can't cope with life as it is are being doubly and triply punished and I, I, I just feel this is terrible it's not mm. a punishment it's a choice people want to spend their money in an ill-advised way and this isn't an ill-advised way to spend your money then you have every right to spend your money in the ill-advised way which you choose to do so just don't see that it's any business of anyone else's to come in and tell them that they can't do it, especially when we have this thing around, it's always about the poor, it's always as if the poor can't make their own decisions. Nobody says it when people are trading uh, in shares. As well, the rich do that, oh, well, we've got to get rid of that. That is gambling that, in exactly the same manner. Yeah, you're, you're right that it is a matter of personal choice, but if you actually make it as attractive to people who can't cope in order that they should not be able to cope even more, I think that's wicked. And to say that it's their right to go down the pan and to be even poorer than they are is even more wicked. But, but it is. I mean, th this is it. You can't legislate for good judgment. It's not good judgment to use the machines. I fully you're accept looking at it the wrong way around. It's not a question of, of stopping them. It's a question of, of having been wrong to have, have started this, down this road in the, in the first place. There is a, such a thing as social responsibility. We do have a responsibility for people who are vulnerable. I completely agree, which is why, you know, if you have a very bad time economically, then you step in and you help us to say it's absolutely why you provide information and decent education to make sure that people can make those judgments mm. for themselves. Let's but they have to, to be able to make them. Could you mind, got lots to do. Tuition fees could be linked to course costs and job prospects. This seems sort of in line with what we were talking about earlier, I think, which is really that the government's petrified response to the general election. Because this is, you know, Philip Hammond coming in going, well, look, we're going to try and link tuition fees in this way to try and stop them from rising. They claim to have been utterly shocked, by the way, that when they allowed universities to charge <laughs> certain amount, all of them charged the maximum amount that they could charge at the same time, which, frankly, they were warned would happen. Um, and again, this fear in the conservative machine of the sort of transactional element that Corbyn had in terms of policy with young people, which is predominantly around tuition fees. And now this sort of small, slight, slow readjustment of Tory policy in that direction, this looks to be part of that process. OK. Um, in defence or in praise of Halloumi, an essay by Ian Dunt is, uh, is coming <laughs> up next. 
<laughs> there has been extensive conversation during the advert break of okay. my love of Halloumi and uh, Melanie Phillips, of course, wrong on this subject, as, as we were surprised. But not this, me. Is the, this is an article about the middle class must haves, as if the cost of living crisis hasn't impacted certain sections of society. Well, it's, it's the, basically, you know, this, <clears throat> this, what was previously considered very exotic, very strange food, is now coming into Waitrose as sort of essential sections, which used to be baked beans and sausages. Oh, it's about essentials, right, OK. Right. Well, you see, I think that there's a rather nice story here, which is basically, I mean, this is obviously treated as look at how insanely bourgeois and spoiled that we have all become. But actually, it seems to me like this is people suddenly, for the, one of the first times, you know, in, in people's history, you can get foods from across the world. You can get them really easily by very, very complex trade <laughs> networks, by the way, in order to provide this to us all the time. Is that no, a Brexit really, dig? Anyway, well, sort of, well, sort of, but <laughs> there, there is a beauty to that. And the fact that right now we get to eat food that, are, you know, that even our grandparents would never have dreamed would be a staple. So I think it's easy to scoff at this. And of course, I'm, I'm in no position to say that we shouldn't give them that I'm exactly the kind of customer who will buy it. But nevertheless, there's actually something rather, rather lovely about the fact that this is all available to us. OK, a global world. And we'll end with the Pew cartoon. Cappuccino mousse, cappuccino mousse, the man goes across the <laughs> desert. Well, there we are. Your choice, Ian. I can't help you. <laughs> we will see you soon. Thank you, Melanie Phillips, Ian Dunt, as ever. Thank you. <laughs>